Should all our old drafts be forgot and never brought to mind? Should all our first piss be forgot? The open way to find for old lang syne, my dear. For old lang syne, we'll take a car and pass the pack for old. We sat, sat around the table, table. friends curved out and talked our smack. We've bolted birds and brainstorm fetch. Why is this still in the pack? For My dear, for all we'll take a card and pass the pack for all I'll need an edge to get. This wind, so please keep pounding beers. Lose or win, I'll be back again. Here's to more drafts next year. For old legs, my dear. We'll take a card and pass the pack for Final Lucky Paper Radio of 2021. I'm your host, Andy, and I'm here with my co-host, Anthony, thought leader in Smart Lights Maddox. Oh, right, because I came up with the idea of having Smart Lights? Just, you know, you inspired me to actually make the jump in my home to add some Smart Lights. Now, I am not normally a person that actually just likes internetifying everything like i don't want my no, refrigerator i'm pretty shocked that you're going down this road yeah almost I, as shocked as i was about your interest in uh what do you call them, little robot vacuums to be clear my interest in the roomba thing is like if a robot would automatically clean my house of course i want that right sure okay that's fair like yeah. i think some people are interested in them from like a it would be fun to fiddle around with a little robot i have no interest in that at all i don't want like a cool robot in my house so i can like oh look there it goes i just want my house to be clean all the time that's my only motivation mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That I don't think I'm going to do, but I did make the smart light jump. There's only two features I want. All I want is the automatic change in the temperature of the white light over the course of the day so that it's warmer in the morning, cooler in the middle of the day during daylight hours, and warmer at night for all the circadian rhythm stuff that we all hold so dear. And I also, in my particular house, want to be able to have hardwired and non-hardwired lights on the same switch and be able to kind of move that around as I see fit. Both these things are facilitated nicely by fancy smart bulbs. All the rest of it, I do not want. I don't want my bulbs to be programmed to you turn want on the holiday off. mode and red I, and green I for don't Christmas. Want that. I don't want them to automatically turn on when I get near my house or turn off at a certain hour. Or I don't want them to just flash and freak out my dog. I don't want any of that stuff. But I think it's worth it for just those two little features. And I have made the jump. Those are really good features, especially if you're living in a small apartment, small house. Maybe you don't have big windows. Like a lot of houses in Baltimore, uh, having just sort of the ceiling lighting that is daylight temperature just makes it feel like there's more daylight. So I definitely recommend that. 
yeah, you you have a lot of windows though, so let's not. I be also talking, have a lot of. Windows. Let's not be talking <laughs> trash on houses in Baltimore because you have one of the most blighted homes I've been in in Baltimore City. So. That was a key feature of it. Yeah, the end row home turns out to be a pretty good slot. Anyway, thanks for being a role model. Re internet light bulbs. Happy to do it. We'll see if I end up hating it. It's like probably. I like it right now. I am. There's a little tiny anxiety now, which is like. Someday an update Somebody's might break gonna your come house. Over and be like, hey, how do I turn the lights on? Oh, one sec. Let me give no, no, you no. a Wi-Fi password. No, 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 no. <laughs> I have switches set up for everything. You do. I there's no interacting with apps. I'm never gonna. I have no home voice assistant. I'm never gonna instruct somebody to do something for me with my voice. There's no apps that I'm using. It's all light switch enabled still. But you know, someday someone's gonna push an update. It's just gonna break all my lights in my house. That's the world we live in. It's it's gonna happen. Luckily, the the smart bulbs do have the fail case of just being normal light bulbs, as opposed to the fail case of like being on all the time or something which would be kind of bad anyway at the end of the year we at lucky paper always put together a cube in review article where we invite voices from all over the cube community this year we were lucky enough to get most of the people that had cubes featured on magic online to basically submit responses we asked them five questions about the year in cube basically and have them give answers from different perspectives so if you haven't seen that article yet check it out we'll put it in the show notes Anthony and I did not participate in that article. You hear enough of us on this podcast. You know, this is an opportunity for other people to have their voices heard on Lucky Paper. But here on Lucky Paper Radio, this is our podcast, Anthony. So I do want to weigh in, the two of us, on the five questions of the year for Cube. It seems like a good way to do it. So is this episode still coming out in 2021? Yes. All right. They were recording a few ahead in advance because of travel for holidays and whatnot. But uh, this one will be the last one that comes out before the end of the year. Do you just want to dive in with the first question, which is just the Cube hit of the year? Yeah, let's do it. So I was so excited for the Cube hit of the year to be, we can play Cube again at the beginning of this year. Turns out, despite having amazing life-saving vaccines, people have just decided not to do it. So we're still living in hell world. So this is going to be an interesting episode. Uh, so my Cube Bring in a year, fun energy, I got to say right off the bat. <laughs> definitely am feeling a fun energy. Uh <laughs> You know, it's just reflecting on the year. That, that That's exactly what it is. Is I, I put some thought into the answers to these questions, and this year has just not had a fun energy. I'm going to try and do a better <laughs> job. So my Cupid of the Year is actually just that they have, on Magic Online, continued to put out uh, and make available all kinds of different unique cubes from the cube community and really broaden sort of the spectrum of of the kinds of cubes that are available there. You know, there's lots of cards we're going to talk about, I'm sure, and cool sets full of cool cards but I, I don't think any of them have had as much of an impact on sort of like how we perceive Cube and who's playing Cube as just expanding that breadth there and allowing people to really explore that Cube is not just, you know, this exact thing that is the Magic Online Cube. And even more so because they're bringing in designers from outside of Wizards of the Coast, you know, mm-hmm. players that are experienced with Cube and are doing all kinds of novel things. This is sort of the biggest like format or meta format of the community and that we really can make it whatever we want it to be. That's a good answer and very encouraging. Mine's a little more parochial. So the hit of the year could be anything, right? We intentionally leave it pretty wide open. It could be something very broad like you've described. Mine is a specific cycle, and it's the Creature Lands sort of Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. Uh, I thought this was a really good cycle of Creature Lands, the Cave of the Frost Dragon and Hive of the Eye Tyrant, Den of the Bugbear, Hall of Frost Tight, Hall of Frost Giant. Hall of the Frost Giants? I think there are multiple Frost Giants. Okay. One Bugbear. And then uh, something, 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 something <laughs> green one, Hydra. I actually don't know the green one because I don't play that particular one. I, I think these were an exciting cycle of, of lands. And my first reaction was being excited about them because they seemed powerful. They were, you know, lands that on the first two turns of the game were kind of just a strict upgrade over a basic land, you know, wasteland notwithstanding. But they came in untapped. They produced a color of mana and also had this ability to be animated in the late game. I do like creature lands a lot, but as someone that has a low enough curving environment that tap lands are a big cost, I don't get to run quite as many as I like. So I was really excited to see creature lands that fit in my environment and made sense. And that was my initial excitement about them. As I play with them more, I'm still excited about them, but for different reasons. And the reasons are that they actually, I think, contribute to more novel sequencing and like interesting sequencing decisions than you might expect. Like you'd think, oh, it's in my opening hand. I obviously play this land for sure first. And my first two turns of the game, so it comes in untapped. But the reality I felt in my own cube, at least, is that so often the first couple lands you want to get into the play are going to be dual lands. You want basically to leave your options open for casting spells of multiple colors in the first couple turns of the game. And if you want to lead on a thought seize or hold up a counter spell, you just can't play Cave of the Frost Dragon on turn one or two. Or you can if you make the assessment that actually holding up one of those things is not as important as this coming into play untapped right now so I can spend my mana on something else. 
and not have to pay this cost of playing a chap land later in the game. So while I actually think they're a little less powerful than I initially evaluated them, uh, I'm actually so equally excited about them because I think they add some depth to this like creature land card type and also add some depth to these sequencing decisions of do you want to get the benefit of playing this early and having it come in untapped or do you want to get the benefit of leaving your colors of mana open and fixing your mana as, cer- as early as possible so that you can present as many possible spells as you can. I totally agree. I mean, I, I love, love creature lands. It, they just, like you're saying, they just offer such interesting sequencing decisions and gameplay and interesting novel choices and having that sort of well of, of that card type. I mean, it's not strictly a card type, but that, that type of class to card. get a little bit deeper is just a, a great asset to people that are designing cubes. Yeah, and honestly, the whole cycle, like, sick art, cool names, like, I just, I like pretty much all the cards. I think they're just cool cards. How do you feel about the, uh, what do they call them, the, the module alternate frames? The ones that look like a, a Dungeons, uh, sorry, a, yeah, a Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, like, sure, uh, yeah, yeah, booklet. yeah. Yeah, the showcase versions from Adventures. Those are not for me, but I'm glad they exist. I, I like that Wizards continues to make wild-looking versions of cards for people that want to run them, but uh, no, that particular card frame is not to my taste. They're super cool, though. I, I actually just completed my cycle of them, and they don't really look like magic cards, but they, they look really cool just yeah. as objects. I, I really appreciate them. So that's my hit of the year. Our second question is miss of the year. Um, we'll alternate who goes first here, so I'll, I'll take this one first. I, I thought about this a lot, and I think there were some good answers from the respondents in our article about miss of the year. And to me, to like crystallize the thing that I think was the biggest miss this year for Cube in the magic world was just double face cards. We talked about this kind of at length on the podcast and about how, you know, we both kind of avoid double face cards for different reasons and in different contexts. And it was last year that we ended the year with Zendikar Rising and the introduction of modal double face cards where we got those lands with spells or permanents on the front. Those cards I thought were great successes. And generally, the cube community responded to those very positively because in that situation, a lot of the weird complexity of double face cards or modal double face cards especially is negated by there just being a land on the back that comes into play tap. It's pretty simple. It doesn't take a lot of cognitive energy to understand. You don't have to flip a card around to read it in the draft. Like, it's all pretty straightforward. So those cards are very well received. And then, starting with Call Time this year, like, Call Time, Strixhaven, Avengers of the Forgotten Realms just all had modal double face cards that I think were largely poorly designed game pieces. They were really complicated. I think very few of the designs were resonant at all. Like, very oftentimes, it was just two things stapled to each other for no logical reason. Or maybe the logical reason was buried somewhere in some Nordic lore that you have to (laughs) understand to like get get why the card was designed that way. They just weren't memorable. Like I I don't think they were memorable. Very few of them are in my cube. And we saw in our cube surveys that people generally ranked a lot of these double face cards quite a bit lower than you would expect similar cards that were not double faced to be. And then for me, that thing that really drove this home is the miss of the year is that I think having all of that saturation of double face cards in all of those sets throughout the entire year then meant that when we got to Crimson Vow and we got to Midnight Hunt, we got to Innistrad, the block that double face cards is a big part of its identity. It's a big part of what makes Innistrad Innistrad. I think it just diluted that completely. And the double face cards there, people were just done with them already. And it made those cards way less special because we had just been buried in this avalanche of double face cards throughout the year. So I don't know if this is a byproduct of more attention being paid to arena and digital formats where I think some complexity is inherently managed by the interface and you don't have to worry about it like the fact that you can view both sides of double face card in a draft because it's digital and no one cares and the the card faces are all kind of irrelevant anyway it's basically like just two cards next to each other maybe that's a contributor to this fact but for me i I really hope we see them pump the brakes on this in the new year and we just don't get as many of these double face cards all over the spectrum i totally agree i i I just Honestly, just find them exhausting, you know, set after set, just like, oh, we have double face cards again. Like the draft is going to be complicated again. Every there are time. still cards I have not read all of the text on. <laughs> yes, for sure. And it's something where it's like, I don't have the expectation that every set's going to be for me and I'm going to love every card. But just, you know, going into a limited format, it really like exhausting is the, is the way that yeah. I, I want to put it. Uh, Fatigue. And it, it was just a bunch of cards that I'm just, you know, generally not going to put into cubes with a, a few particular exceptions. Yeah. And it felt to me like a thing that, they, it kind of immediately became a somewhat evergreen thing, and it really feels like it should be like a thing they tried in one set. And like if it worked great, if it didn't work, they would come back to it. But it's more evergreen at this point than like cycling and flashback and these like very core bread and butter mechanics that I think are pretty much always successful. And I don't think it works as well as either of those things, especially if you're playing in paper like we are for the most part. For sure. This is definitely the hardest 
of all these questions for me to answer because it's the one negative one, you know. Well, it's negative, but also to say like what what missed you have to have some target or expectation of what you were wanted to happen uh and for me it's like yeah they're gonna make a bunch of sets they're gonna make a bunch of magic cards maybe some of these are gonna be reasonable for my cubes maybe not uh we'll sort of see what happens so it's hard for me to say that anything really missed but i I definitely agree on the double face cards i'll also agree with uh dom harvey's answer from the article about sort of the the linearness of a lot of the set mechanics and the fact that large chunks of the cards from a lot of these sets really just weren't good fits for cube because they were part of these like really highly synergistic mechanics. And I'll say this is specifically potentially a miss for cube because right. I think that does make sense for the limited environments and, and even standard too. And standard. Yeah. I mean and, and magic has progressively moved from the sort of set design where people just sat down and said, let's just design a bunch of cards we think are cool and put them into a set and see what happens and kind of standard environments where literally you'd have players saying oh it's so cool that you seeded this combo like how long did you expect people to figure out this like one kind of cool deck and the designer saying uh we had no idea yes, this was gonna uh, happen <laughs> yeah so let me check our notes here about our projected timeline for you figuring that out mm-hmm, for sure so I, I think that as magic has become much more sort of refined and developed we do see limited formats and standard formats that just there's a lot more sort of expectation from the designers and and like i I could you can see this both as a positive and a negative but i think overall the game is much more streamlined but what that means is a lot of those cards just don't fit as well into these kinds of like cube environments where you do want to sort of curate like this is you know the the best from all kinds of formats whatever best means for you when the standouts and highlights from a lot of the the current sets just kind of fit best within that set. Yeah. And in some cases, you know, it was not just that the mechanics were synergistic mechanically. Like in the case of dungeons, we talked a lot about how having one card that ventures into mm-hmm. the dungeon is totally fine mechanically. Like it's not at all synergistic. It doesn't right, require you, you to have say, multiple cards. This card says enters the battlefield, you either gain a life or scry one right. or whatever the other choice is. Right. But the the like the synergistic part of that mechanic was just all of the complexity buried in it and the fact that there's a whole other like kind of token card you have to track like all this additional stuff that had to happen that you know it's not that you were in a game actions way paid off necessarily for having a bunch of venture into the dungeon but just from a bookkeeping accounting way like it just it feels bad to play with just one example of it right and some people are cubing one or two dungeon venture cards and i've talked to people that tried them thinking they would be able to tolerate it and then just cut them because they couldn't very similar thing for the the day night transformation i think as well totally we're like that also, you know, as we saw in the original Innistrad, like, works just fine on its own. There's no reason you can't have a card with just Day Night on its own. It's not mechanically parasitic or synergistic, whatever you want to sort of call it. But all that additional complexity is buried in this, like, outside thing. That right. Just- and, and, and that complexity is meaningful when, you know, 20% of the set cares about it. It's like, oh, cool. I'm in this dungeon and there's a good chance I'm going to draw another card that cares about that dungeon. So right. I'm actually interested in tracking that because it matters to my game plan yeah. when it's just one and it's like, oh, I guess technically like this creature could die. And then yep. there's like one regrowth effect or my opponent could like cast a time spiral and, and shuffle will, yeah. my graveyard back into my library. It's like, I don't really care about it, but I do technically have to keep track of that. That really does add some complexity that it's just, it is fun in one context and it's not really meaningful in another. Yeah. And this is a great example of like, that's just not for cube, right? Like yeah. I, curated limited format from the whole history of magic is not what they had in mind when they designed day night. And when they designed venture into the dungeon, these were not things that were designed for, with that context in mind. So it's a miss in a sense that like that was a bunch of design equity and cards that got printed that like could have maybe been interesting for cube, but just ended up not being because they included these flagship mechanics that just don't really work in our format for the most part, unless you're really committed to them. I also think this even more so than double face cards is a byproduct of the, increased focus on digital magic oh, tracking sure. tracking day night and tracking the dungeon levels and stuff like that all just happens automatically right you don't have to think about it at all it just happens for you and that makes the practical accounting complexity of playing these cards much less on a digital platform as opposed to doing it in paper i'm not complaining about that obviously like that's just a reality like magic is probably as much if not more so a video game at this point than it is a actual physical card game i mean obviously the physical cards are important to them because that's a big part of their actual revenue but you know, Arena is also a huge part of the revenue stream. And with COVID and the lack of any kind of formalized, organized paper play for the most part, like, that's just what Magic is now. And this makes it to me all the more important that Cube remains the thing about Magic that I love, which is playing in paper with my friends. But it doesn't mean there are less cards that are going to be printed. And I think a higher chance that in the future, we're going to see more mechanics like this that just work digitally. And in paper, it's like, oh, it's actually a little clunky. 
definitely. At the same time, they're also just producing so many more sets and cards that even if a lower proportion of cards feel relevant to whatever you or I or our listeners are doing, there's still a ton of things that They are. printed so many cards this year. I, saw, I did see a graph of the most unique cards printed per year over the course of uh, the past like 10 or 15 years and steep increase. Yeah. And that is not even counting the versions of cards. I'm sure if we had like actual unique collector number variations of cards that would be through the roof with all of the showcase oh, and totally. alternate art and ex- expended frame like making a lot of magic these days so so yeah i think i think it's always really important to sort of have that step back and shift of in perspective and not get uh, absolute quantities and relative quantities confused right and that's the whole point of why i like cube is i can't ignore the stuff i don't like so yep. to say that i'm mad at they didn't print more stuff for me it's like i still got so much stuff for me and my cube this year that uh just noting the things that didn't line up with those particular values so what did line up with your values? What is your cube card of the year? That was such a good se- segue that I'm not even going to say that you should go first on this one like we had planned. I narrowed it down to two. I have to say, I have to mention two. Okay, I narrowed it down to 10, so you're ahead of me. I have some honorable mentions we're going to touch on as well because people love when we talk about individual cards. It's so fun. My card of the year for my cube is Merktide Regent. We talked about it last week. I hinted that I was going to talk about it again this week. And when I look at all the cards printed over the course of the year. This is the one that really just ticks all of my boxes and, and makes me happy. Just to rehash a little bit of what I said last week we were talking about in the context of the most recent draft of my cube. It's my card of the year, not just because it's a card that I really love and I like the play patterns of it and it's going to be in my cube for a long time, but it also changed the way I think about how certain types of decks operate, uh, specifically with regards to like delve threats, basically. You know, I wasn't on a card like Tossiger up until I tried Merktide Regent and loved it. And again, the play pattern of rewarding you for spending the first one to three or four turns of the game, holding up interaction, holding up disruption spells, casting your thought seizes, casting your counter spells, casting your removal spells, rewarding that by then giving you a very cheap threat, still at a part of the game where it's somewhat early. Like, you know, an 8-8 eight, eight on turn five is still extremely early to play an 8-8 eight, eight flyer, right? That's still an extremely undercosted body. And the mechanic leading you to that play pattern naturally is something I, I really, really enjoy about the card. I also got to say that getting a payoff in blue for delve that is a threat and the threat is just a giant dragon <laughs> is is really fun like i've had treasure cruise and dig through time in my cube forever basically since the cube was conceived years ago and those cards have always been good and they will remain good and so i, I was aware how delve was powerful for those cards but they don't have that kind of play pattern i just described right like you were always going to wait as long as you possibly could to cast your treasure cruise there was no question about that just because it's a nine mana spell it draws you more cards it's like the last thing you do with your hand pretty much and something like Merktide Regent, you do want to get into play because it affects the board and it changes the actual clock and things in play. And so having an actual creature in blue that is a like game-ending payoff is really, really great for these sort of delve threats. The last thing I want to say I didn't say last week about this is that Merktide Regent is also this perfect card that comes along so rarely where it is a threat that I think both blue-based control decks and blue-based more proactive decks like a tempo deck a blue red aggro deck or something are equally interested in and that is so so rare i think if you look at you know cards like monastery mentor is a is a good spell slinging payoff it's kind of a similar thing to mark Tide region you want a lot of cheap cantrips in your deck in my experience you can't really play a monastery mentor as part of like the top end of your white based aggro deck you just can't do it like you can't really play it in a super proactive deck it's more of a control i've certainly learned that the hard way yeah it's more of a control win con similar thing if you also think about like young pyromancer is another great example of like you want it in a blue based deck i'll play young pyromancer in my controlling decks like it's fine but where it really shines is where you're playing it in a very proactive deck that is using its spells to remove creatures and apply pressure with all of these tokens very quickly and so Merktide Region to me is like this perfect card that just does everything both these decks wants, right? Like it gives the tempo deck a huge threat that it can cast early in the game, which is very powerful. It gives the control decks a very cheap win condition they can play while also holding up counter magic to protect it. It doesn't pull strongly in either direction. It's very flexible in that regard. So yeah, my number one card for my cube is Merktide Region for the year. I remember last year when I was putting together the responses from the community for the 2020 Cuban review, I was like, hoping somebody would mention Shark Typhoon. And the last responses I got were John Terrell's and he made his card of the year Shark Typhoon. And I'm like, great, I don't have to... <laughs> I was considering writing my own responses anonymous, just so Shark... Anonymous cube designer. <laughs> just so Shark Typhoon could be mentioned as card of the year. I had a similar feeling this year of hoping somebody would mention Merktide Regent. Nobody did, so I got to do it on this podcast. That's the card of the year for me. The other card of the year I want to mention, 
which uh, was also mentioned by a contributor to this article by Fizzled, captured by Legax, I think is a beautiful, perfectly designed magic card that I'm so glad we got printed this year, both for cubes that are popper or rarity restricted or cubes that are just lower power level and are trying to pursue specific themes like plus one, plus one counters or whatever. This like three mana pacifism that also puts a plus one, plus one counter on up to two target creatures solves so many of the problems I have with like pacifism style removal, which is like the pacifism O-ring stuff. I like the fact that they're efficient removal and they're like limited in scope to what they do, but I don't love that they can be so cleanly answered. I really struggle with that kind of play pattern where if you play a Banishing Light or an Oblivion Ring or a Pacifism in your deck, you are kind of just putting this big risk out there that you might get blown out by a Reclamation Sage or whatever kind of enchantment removal exists in the environment. And here, that support to staple to this effect, uh, I think, makes this card mm, a beautiful gem. It shines perfectly because even if you do eventually have a thing removed and you're, the creature you remove comes back, it is not a total blowout for you. You still got some value off of it. And on top of that, if it does just come together, if you get to remove the thing and also put two counters in your creature, then it just is extremely powerful and effective. It also similarly rewards the kind of play that I want decks that are playing that kind of removal to employ, especially green-white decks, which is play a bunch of cheap threats, then once you've got a board presence, then play your removal, right? Like this does not go in a control deck. This is not, you know, the kind of thing that you just play to remove whatever is your opponent plays and then, you know, play your threats later. This goes in a proactive deck that wants to attack that also wants some interaction. So I thought that card was perfect. Great art, good name. I like the callback to Saddleback Legac. I thought that was really fun. So those are my two cards of the year. I struggled with this one as well. I also definitely, have. A, I mean, I'm a sucker for green-white cards. I'm going to like a green-white card that says target a bunch of things and put a bunch of counters on it. I love a lot of uh, some of the really efficient removal, like bone shards that we got and portable hole that they just fit really nice uh, sort of spots in a lot of different cubes. And a lot of these cards scale really well, which I appreciate. But as I was looking through so many of these cards, mostly looking at a particular set, a lot of them are just sort of like twists or sort of like interesting new versions of kinds of cards that we've seen before. And I don't know that that really qualifies as like, what is the, the card of the year? I'm going to go with something a little bit surprising and name the uh, the Bridges, the Indestructible Artifact Land Cycle from Modern Horizons All 2. right, I like it. All those other cards, I think, you know, they're, they're going to make it in a lot of cubes. They're going to be meaningful, but I don't think they're going to shape those environments. And, and of all the things we've seen this year, I think that the the artifact lands really are shaping a lot of pe- people's sort of perspectives on what they can do with cubes. I mean, we just saw the artifact cube yeah. on Magic Online. And, and I think the big part of it is because the sort of mana bases of a lot of cubes is pretty uniform. You know, people are playing the best, uh, most efficient mana bases you can in most contexts, uh, maybe with a little bit of exceptions here or there for, uh, you know, some creature lands and things like that. But these just offer such an interesting new opportunity to say, well, we can actually make the mana base really synergistic with this totally other different strategy. And I think that's really pushed a lot of unique cube design and, and again, sort of opened up the the sort of meta format in a, in a unique way. Yeah, I agree. I, I've talked to people before, cube designers, that have really wanted to push an artifact theme in their cube and have put the Mirrodin artifact lands in their cube for that reason. And they do so kind of begrudgingly because they're like, well, I really right. want it's some like, artifacts in here. It's hard to want to put a monocolored artifact right. land. And then... In environments that are artifact matters, like you do you open yourself the removal, up, yeah. <laughs> you open yourself up to turning a lot of cards into a uh, sinkhole all of a sudden, which is maybe a huge liability. And so these fix both of those problems and kind of do feel like they were designed with things like cube in mind, right? Like I right. would not be surprised if the design file for this was like, I bet cubes will love this because it allows you to put mana fixing in your cube, which pretty much every cube wants in some density, while also satisfying this thematic archetypal checkbox and giving you more artifacts to play with for the things you're playing with artifacts and also doesn't open you up to a shatter just you know ruining your entire game because you were stuck on three lands now you're stuck on two lands because your opponent shattered your one artifact land so i i agree i think for all the reasons that's probably like one of the bigger new spaces that cube designers get to explore and can actually change the landscape of what kinds of cubes people will design because these cards exist. Right, and I think more than just saying oh now people are also building artifact cubes i think a lot of people are saying oh I can build an artifact cube, and also now I'm more open to the idea that cubes can be a lot of different things. So I just love seeing that space grow and have more sort of variety. I wonder if one of those artifact lands might actually be good enough for the degenerate micro cube. Oh my. I can't imagine. I mean, it does come into play tapped, which is a huge it cost. It does come into play tapped. But I've got Tinker, I've got Talarian Academy, That's I've got true. Mox Opal. 
I'm th- I'm be thinking about that because I'm also thinking about making that cube a little bigger. So I have some slots to fill. Maybe I'll give it a little test. I, I I can't leave this segment without having some honorable mentions for cards that I also love this year. These cards I don't think are necessarily revolutionary. They don't maybe deserve to be the card of the year, but cards I just really loved. I loved Unholy Heat. I still think people are overall pretty low on that card as relative to what they should be. I think that card's kind of messed up. I really liked Blood Sky Berserker and Clarion Spirit and this cast two spells mechanic that we saw on both those two drops. And I hope we get more of that kind of thing in the future. I thought those were really great. Elite Spellbinder was almost my card of the year. And if not from Murtai Region, probably would have been just because I love the invitational cards that we used to get with every year with the, with the invitational and bringing them back for PVDDR to get his, his not, what's what's like namesake, likeness. but your face, his likeness. Thank you. <laughs> what's namesake, but for faces to get his likeness on a card and have that card, I think be very interesting and bring that like frogkin kidnapper style mechanic that we saw on the mystery booster playtest cards to a real black border magic card. I think was very exciting. Prismari command was the card that I always wanted electrolyze to be this flexible blue red instant that just gives you a lot of value. You can play in a lot of different contexts and I do get to mention Asika's Chariot, a card that I initially didn't think fit with my own cube, but I think turned out to be a fantastic fit. And I think this card has a really beautiful balance of a good floor, doing something strong pretty much all the time, even a good floor in the face of removal, but not like a broken high floor in the face of removal. And then also having this like nice range of being able to copy different kinds of tokens for different kinds of value and different kinds of decks. That means that most of the time it's a pretty good scalable kind of snowballing threat that a cube of that power level will be pretty happy to play. But as I mentioned, when we reevaluated this card or I reevaluated this card, I like that it also is susceptible to like a lots of different kind of removal. Like if you have a artifact removal spell, you can get rid of the chariot itself. Of course, the tokens are left behind. If you have a creature removal spell, you can also kill the chariot if you want, or you can kill a creature to try and keep them from crewing the chariot. If you think that's a viable strategy for you, if you have a board wipe, you get to kill both creature tokens, but then the vehicles that's there could maybe be reanimated later on it just has a lot of different ways to be answered in incremental ways which to me creates a really like interesting texture to the gameplay so those are my honorable mentions of the year a lot of cards i know but i I love magic cards i gotta mention the ones i really like you said you had 10 honorable mentions well it was the the 10 lands oh (laughs) (laughs) i see what you did there set of the year anthony can we just kind of take Modern Horizons 2 off of the (laughs) contention list, or at least talk about why Modern Horizons 2 is, in my opinion, pretty objectively the set of the year for Cube, and then maybe move on to the second most impactful set of the year? No, I think we should talk about the most impactful set of the year. It's it's absolutely Modern Horizons 2. This was the most relevant... I think this was most relevant to most cube designers, but I think for relevant reasons that are worth talking about. It's not just it because... It didn't have double face cards. It didn't have double face <laughs> cards. It's not just because it had a lot of powerful cards. Uh, I think it's because the sort of the design of it, the way it was put together and the kinds of cards that were put into it were very, very distinct from these other sets. Yeah. Like we were talking about, a lot of these sets are designed to create very focused, limited environments where there are specific strategies and there's specific, like a very limited, constrained set of mechanics that are happening. And Modern Horizons is the opposite of that. It was Time Spiral, which uh, Modern Horizons 1 was basically Time Spiral coming back. And then this is the same thing again. It was just, let's make a whole bunch of cool cards. And they don't necessarily have to fit in this like really refined, streamlined draft format that is going to be played again and again. Uh, It can just be something special and overly complex and do a bunch of wild stuff. And out of that, we just got all kinds of interesting cards. And to me, I think the most interesting part is how much design space there is in Magic that this really highlighted. So often it feels like they've made so many Magic cards. How can they possibly design a new Magic card that we haven't seen before? And then they make dragon's rage channel or it's like oh well of course you want to mix and match surveil and delirium like those are perfect mechanics to fit together but you're never going to see that unless there's some really specific set that happens to be about those right. particular mechanics and but so you many- could spell it out theoretically like you, it's not unreasonable it's to think in a set with delirium you just spell out the surveil mechanic without actually putting surveil on it but i agree it's for example consider i agree it's much more likely to show up in I have set like Modern Horizons too. And that is one of the great advantages of these sets, I think. They're very indulgent. Absolutely. Indulgent's a great word. There's all kinds of different cards where I'm just, when I look at them, I just immediately thought there is so much design space left in Magic. Like this is almost like low hanging fruit still, but just isn't created for all kinds of reasons that aren't. This is not a good card. Yeah, I mean, I agree. And obviously it was a really impactful set of the year if you are trying to make a cube that plays the most powerful cards in Magic's history because Modern Horizons 2 brought us many, many, many very powerful cards that are currently 
as one might expect, completely reshaping modern and legacy and vintage. <laughs> so for those cube designers, obviously that was an important part of the set. But for all the reasons you mentioned otherwise, like, I think equally very impactful for people that are playing at an explicitly limited or restricted power level or at a restricted rarity because it just had so much going on and had so many, like, I feel like in some ways the design process for a set like Modern Horizons is very conducive to the way cubes are built because the cards, like you said, are not meant to be part of like an overarching theme within a set. They're just like kind of atomic they're like this is is this card cool does it work on its own and does it like stand in a set where it doesn't have the support of a specific theme or mechanic and if it doesn't then it probably doesn't get printed in modern horizons too right like it has to actually fit for it to make even see print and so all the cards a priori are just kind of better fits in environments where there's less given right where they where cards have to stand on their own more more reliably right and just so we don't get angry tweets yes there are definitely some themes and draftable sort of archetypes within the set right. but it's not the same kind of level of streamlined as Strixhaven was, for example. For sure. For sure. Do you have a second set that you want to talk about, though? I do. So, I mean, honestly, like, I almost felt like the question of set of the year was shouldn't even have been asked to people because everyone was going to say Modern Horizons. What was the set response. of the year and why was it Modern Horizons? Pretty much, yeah. It was pretty much how that went. I do think there's a pretty big gap between the next set I liked and then the remainder. And uh, Strixhaven, for me, was the second best set of the year by far. Uh, I think there's a pretty big gap there between that and... Call Time probably is the next best one for me, and my, my next favorite, I think. And what I really liked about Strixhaven was, first of all, it had a, a theme of modality that was kind of woven throughout it. And I do really like modal effects. I like the decisions they give players. And not only do we see a whole cycle of commands, which just will always spark joy in my heart, but just a lot of modal effects kind of throughout the entire thing. Learning Lesson was a modal mechanic. And even though Learning Lesson doesn't really work in Cube, I think we kind of saw this modality as a theme in Strixhaven, which I was really grateful for. I also think Strixhaven was great for cube designers because it brought some unique payoffs to themes that we don't often get in specific colors because this was an entire set built around instants and sorceries. Normally in core set magic, blue and red are kind of the only colors that really get to care about casting instants and sorceries or having instants and sorceries in your deck. The Abzan wedge shard, whatever it is, generally doesn't really get to care about those things pretty much. I mean, there's exceptions, obviously. Again, we don't need tweets, but that's just kind of how that works. And ultimately, this is one of those things that I don't... There are some things that I am I kind of a color pie purist on. I was talking in the Discord the other day about how I don't really want them to print a bunch of white counter spells from a color pie perspective, right? and I don't want to see burn spells in another color. Like There are some things that I really think are very helpful delineations between the color pie that We've talked about it at, at length on this show as to why we think that's valuable. Caring about instances and sorceries in some way, to me, is broad enough that I'm glad to see that brought to multiple colors. I think the way that a Quandrix apprentice cares about instances and sorceries is flavorfully distinct from the way that a young pyromancer cares about instances and sorceries. And so I think that the cards that were printed in this set, especially in the white, green, and black color combinations that acknowledge the existence of this card type in some sort of positive synergistic way, I think does open up a lot of avenues for additional layers of cube design. Because, you know, the reason I think that works is because the instances and sorceries in those colors are already different, right? They all get instances and sorceries, right? And they do different things. You're not going to get a bunch of burn spells in green or a bunch of cantrips in white. So the fact that they already have unique identities to those spells themselves, to me, means that having payoffs in each color for those for that theme is totally fine. It doesn't really break the color pie because a white-black sorceries deck is going to inherently play way differently than a blue-black instants and sorceries deck because the instants and sorceries that are going to be the core pillar of those decks are going to be so different that the payoffs, I think, can be in all five colors without really diluting the meaningful identity of those colors. So for the modality reason and for bringing that theme to all five colors in a very robust way, I really like Strixhaven. I did really like that sort of uh, the overarching design of Strixhaven, how unlike a lot of previous faction set designs where it was like, yep, this faction has this mechanic, this faction has this mechanic. Everyone kind of had the same mechanic, but the details and the way that that mechanic was used was different. So I did really appreciate that aspect of, the, of that uh, set. I also got to say, if you had told me that the set I was going to like this year was going to be the wizard school set when we were, <laughs> we were going to have the Nordic lore set and the... Dungeons and Dragons set and two separate Innistrad sets, I would not have expected that the Wizard School set would have been my favorite, but it really worked out. I also just like, I think the flavor and art in that set is actually kind of great for the most part. 
Like I really love the animated ink of the the Orzov silver yeah, that quill. Yeah, was a cool approach to that. The, the the creative direction, especially on the silver quill cards, to me, like the fact that writing was like the the magic for silver quill and like the animated ink, I think was really really cool. And so yeah, I, the set just kind of ticked all my boxes. And if it had had way less double face cards, I think I would have really loved it. And uh, you know, could have been one of my favorite sets for cube of all time. But still, some uh, some holes there a little bit. A couple things holding it back. The Quandrix art direction there was a big miss for me, though. When when they announced, well, you, you love shapes so much that you like when they're when they're sullied, when they're used shallowly. I love shapes. I guess I I guess do. I do love you shapes, love shapes. Sure, and I love fractals. Fractals are very cool. And so when they were saying, "Oh, fractals are going to be the theme of of one of these schools," I was like, "You were okay. so mad that it wasn't a Mandelbrot set on all of these." Well, cards. I was I was either thinking like this is going to be amazing and just like like highly textured spells with all this complex uh, sort of filigree could look really awesome or we could end up with a Mandelbrot set with googly eyes on it. And we did end up with a Mandelbrot set with googly eyes on it. And that was just a little bit too much for me. (laughs) I will also give a little bit of a shout out to Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. For all the reasons we said, a lot of the mechanics that were present there were fairly linear and don't really fit in a lot of types of cubes. But Magic and D&D have a long intertwingled history. And even before this set, on, if you go on the cube map, there was a whole island of people that were already trying to build D&D themed cubes because yeah. these games are really tightly linked. People nerds love them. And people want to, you know, play magic with sort of the, the lore and, and feel of Dungeons and Dragons. Pandering's the wrong word, but like reinforcing and and exploring that space uh, that really appeals to a lot of those players and giving them tools to build the Dungeons and Dragons themed cube that they always wanted. Uh, I think it's very cool. All right, Anthony, I think the biggest question and the most difficult one to answer, frankly, for most people, is the cube level up moment of the year. So the question is, how did your cube design thinking level up this year? And I think it's my turn to go first. For me, I think this year was really about doing a better job in my head, distinguishing the subtle differences between what makes a card powerful and what makes a card something I'm excited to play with and fit my cube design philosophy. Which is to say, I knew from the past four or five years I've been curating the Bun Magic Cube that I like playing with powerful magic cards, as I think a lot of people do. Like, it's fun to play with powerful cards for a bunch of superficial reasons. Like, it's just fun to cast iconic cards that you've seen played in constructed matches and, you know, heard talked about in hallowed terms before. But it's also just, I I just found it, like, powerful cards were fun. And for this year, I think I did a much better job inside of my own brain figuring out what are the aspects of cards that I enjoy that make them powerful and what are the aspects of cards that make them powerful but maybe are not something I enjoy. I think this year it saw me cutting and intentionally skipping cards from my cube that were otherwise definitely powerful enough that in, in previous years I probably would have tried out anyway. But this year I've done a better job really identifying the things that are, I value that are correlated with power level but are not necessarily you know one-to-one. So what I mean is I like cheap spells. I just really like cheap effects. <laughs> We've talked about it a lot on the show. It's, uh, it's kind of a broken record for anyone that listens every week. And very oftentimes, cheap spells are also very powerful, right? If you look at legacy, vintage, modern, always eternal formats, there is a strong pull to be doing things as efficiently as possible if you are trying to maximize your win percentage. And so efficiency, mana efficiency, and spell efficiency is definitely very strongly correlated with power level. But that's not why I like it. I like it because I like taking lots of game actions, having lots of decisions available to me. I would rather run more cheap cards in my cube than more powerful cards in my cube. If I can cut a objectively better three drop that's going to increase win percentages more and make the deck that drafts it stronger for a one drop that is perfectly playable and serviceable, gives your gives you gives you and your opponent interesting decisions to make on multiple turns of the game, is relevant at all different stages. I'm just doing more of that previous thing. Similar, something similar can be said for modal effects. Like flexible cards are also powerful in a in a constructed eternal sense. Like that's just good. And that's the thing. It's just kind of correlated with power level. But again, I I like flexible cards not because they are powerful necessarily, just because I like having that flexibility. And so cards that are just way overstated or just uh, their sort of raw rate is just way over the top, uh, or like do something that is an effect I don't really like. For example, this year saw me cutting hex drinker, which is a powerful card. It's a scalable card. But it also has this non-interactivity that uh, I ended up just identifying as a thing I don't really want in my cube. It doesn't really add any depth to it. It's just like, oh, you did the Hex Drinker thing. This is a matchup where I'm not going to have instant speed removal. So you just leveled it up all the way, and now I pretty much can't win. Not particularly fun. So it's kind of a roundabout way of saying, like, I just 
really the answer to this question to me is always I got better at realizing what I like and don't like about magic. But to me this year, I think was very much about disentangling high powered cards from cards that I like and doing a better job weeding out cards that don't fit in both those categories. So it was a high powered card that I don't actually like that was in my cube. A lot of those got cut this year. And similarly, a lot of cards that were a little lower power level, but check off a lot of boxes for the play patterns I'm trying to encourage did get added in. You like powerful cards. We have a whole other conversation to have at some point because we've talked about it before, but there's a lot of things to talk about as to why people like powerful cards. I think there's a lot to unpack It's complicated. So this was actually the easiest question for me to answer. Great. But it's also going to be kind of hard to answer. So for me, ultimately this year, I I think sort of I've had a big reassessment of what I like about magic and how I want to pursue it. And I think a lot of that actually really just crystallized finally in our conversation last week. So when we started playing magic years ago, Uh, We started playing with a local play group and I immediately or, you know, as soon as we really started playing regularly before we we moved from like, uh, you know, I've I've got my deck that we pull out every once in a while to like, I'm going to make this a hobby. I really sort of made a deliberate conscious effort to say, I want to be good at limited. This is how I want to engage with the game, because that's sort of largely how I saw like what the pecking order of the group was and like who was respected were the, the skilled players. And that's how you sort of identify yourself. So one weekend there was a Star City Games event and I just said, I'm going to go and I'm going to do drafts back to back until I learn how to do this. And I got my teeth kicked in again and again. But slowly after a couple of years of just like being deliberate and drafting in paper as much as I possibly could a couple of times a week, I ended up getting okay. Uh, I, I would be maybe not quite the end boss, but uh, someone that people would sort of point out as someone to beat at FNM and I would 3-0 whenever Jay was not there. Uh <laughs> So, I mean, that was that was really fun and was a way that I enjoyed engaging with the game. I mean, really, like, one of the most exciting True spike moments. Path. Exactly. But, like, it's about being a spike, but it's also not. Because the really exciting moments were when someone first, like, calls on you and says, hey, how do these cards work together? My opponent thinks they can do this. Does this work? And suddenly you're known as a person that understands the game and the way the cards work together. And that's sort of been the way that I have thought of myself as a Magic player, is largely as a spike. And... A- a couple months ago, I don't know if you remember this, I was feeling a little down on a Friday night and then, you know, thinking about the world. Uh, Why would and you then, do that? I don't no know. I, I tried world. not to. But then I woke up and I thought, okay, well, there's a new episode of Limited Resources. This is like sort of my escapism. I can like spend the morning, listen to some magic talk and that'll that'll put me straight again. And uh, then they, they announced a new sponsor with an NFT company, and they just went on and on and on about how great this company was and how, how they're doing all this charity. And like the fifth time they were like, and this company's great. They do so much charity. I was like, this is such fucking bullshit. I cannot take this. And I just turned it off and thought, I'll, I'll pick this up later this week. Two weeks max, I'll be back on to listening to Limited Resources, which I'd literally listened to every episode, not missed a week, for years and years, been a patron yeah, for too. years. And I just never picked it up again. I just did, I just didn't want to. Uh, and so that really made me think about what do I actually enjoy from this game? And, and the answer is, I really did enjoy that sort of experience of becoming more skilled and being a better player and learning the rules. But there's a point where you sort of get to this like 95% of uh, skill. And it's like, it's been a fun hobby because you enjoy that learning experience. But that last 5% is just way too much. Like that that's so much disproportionately more effort. And there's this diminishing margin that I just, I, I didn't want to keep going down that route and, and think of myself as someone who is going to continue for that last 5%. I'd much rather put my effort onto other aspects of the game. And at the same time, I was thinking, well, what really is fun, and again, like this whole year has made me reflect on, uh, has it been a year? Who knows? The fun part of the magic is the gathering and getting together and being the person that somebody has decided, you're the person I want to beat now, or you're the person mm-hmm. I go to and ask for rules clarifications for. So the, the social aspect and, and the gathering is really, really important. And looking at my own cubes, Making them accessible to especially new players and a broad range of players is always something I've mentioned, but a little bit sheepishly, because I know most cube designers don't care about that. You know, they have their group of enfranchised players. They want to have maximum complexity and play with all these iconic cards. So I think more people care about it than maybe you're... I, I hope so. I but think I, the most vocal people that like are most active in the Discord and stuff, like true. I think it's a vocal minority thing. I think... Most people that have a cube have never popped in a cube Discord, have never listened to our show, have never visited the cube subreddit. They just built one because they became aware of the idea and like thought it was cool and like put one together. But I actually think it's kind of a minority of people that are like in that we have a set group, we draft every week, and sure. we're all just like mega spikes. So 
Sure. Don't be so, sheepish so, about it, I guess, I, is what I'm saying. I, right. Well, that's that's my level up is I'm not anymore because now I've realized that that really is what is important to me about this game is I, I legitimately want to expand our local play group and bring in more players that are, you know, playing Commander or they're playing Arena and make a place where they can have fun and enjoy this game uh, and, and meet new people. So that's really the core of my level up is I just I just want to think more about this game as a way to bring people together uh, and a way to sort of have creative expression. And that's not to say I'm not still very much a spike. Like when I sit down at the draft and in my games, I want to win. And because that it's not just that I want to win and see my win percent. That's go what up. makes the game a game. It's what makes the game a game. It's not just us playing solitaire and sort of whose deck gets to do a cool thing. I want my decisions. I want to make my decisions meaningful and make my decisions matter. And the way that those decisions matter is both players have an established goal. And I know that my opponent is trying to accomplish the goal of winning the game. So it's not about not being a spike. It's just about really embracing that this is a, a, a social game and I want to focus on that. That's a great answer. I have a lot of a lot of responses. At first, I had the exact same arc with limited resources. I Honestly, uh, the only magic podcast I could tolerate pretty much at the time was like I, all the other ones. You didn't listen to Drive Drive to Work every week? <laughs> you know, I, I do like Drive to Work. I do not listen every week. I will play it based on the topic or guest. I, I feel like the topics where he was like, today, I'm blue. <laughs> those ones were a little rough. I skipped a lot of those. Also, frankly, I, I mean, like this. not a criticism of Mark, but like he repeats himself a lot. And a lot of times I'm like, I'm pretty sure I know 99% of what's yeah. going to be said in this episode because he's talked about it on previous episodes or in articles. And so uh, I skipped those ones too. And for me, you know, like podcasts are a huge part of my life, uh, which is not surprising. And I think I've talked about it on the show before. And so having a show that was a weekly show that was about the game I love was really important to me. And yeah, like I, we shouldn't talk at length. I don't think about the the whole FTX sponsorship thing. And like, no, it's I mean, they're, they're doing a lot of work. They, they want to get paid. They do whatever sure. they're doing. Sure. And like if you can make some money. Great. And uh, the arguments against like, you know, protesting the show or like it's going to happen anyway. Your protest doesn't matter. It's like, yeah, I'm not protesting because I think it's like going to make any difference. I just don't want to hear about this bullshit every week. Like it, yeah. it, it, it diminishes my enjoyment of this thing that I used to enjoy. And now it's just like baldly a like opportunistic pursuit. And, uh, you know, it seems to be uncaring about how the things it supports. And so like, yeah, I just stopped listening because I didn't enjoy it anymore. And, uh, but for me, honestly, the, the arc of like not caring as much about being really good at the game, because I also had the exact same arc of like, this is a fun thing because I want to get good at it and I want to get good at limited and limited is the, is the thing that drew me in because of all of the barriers just to construct and play. I didn't want to have to like build up a construct a collection of modern staples so that I could build modern decks and like learn the meta, like the meta game was never interesting to me. And so it was like limited was what I was, what I was drawn to. I think it really did it for me was arena. It was like, I thought oh, totally. I would, I thought I would like arena. We've talked before about how it came out and I was like, great. I can draft whenever I want. And I just, derived no pleasure from playing magic digitally and it was very clear to me that like if i really cared about getting good at the game i would grind drafts on arena all the time that's the whole point like having magic accessible to you at a competitive level like that's what you would do if you really care about getting good at the game and it's like obviously i don't because if i did that's what i'd be doing i'd be grinding arena and i never did and so that kind of was the final nail in that coffin. Uh, but all these things are are totally tied together. Like when when I was saying I was trying to like do play as much magic as I could, if I was doing two or three paper drafts a week, great. That was as much magic I, as I could actually play because people just aren't hosting drafts that often. Yeah. But that was also a reasonable-ish amount of magic to be playing. Whereas now the most magic I could play is I could play arena and do draft after draft every night, every, you know, spend all my yep. weekends playing it. And that is not reasonable for me. That's not interesting to me. And then if I go and do a paper draft, I'm playing against these people who are putting in that much more effort, right. much, much more frequently. All of this really does tie together. And related is the 17 layouts. I was like, going to mention that too. It's, it, I really it's, was. They should do it. Of course you should do it. We shouldn't We shouldn't say like, in order to preserve the integrity of the of the game, let's like preserve some ignorance. Like, no, we should try and beat the game. Like, Or at least acknowledge that like, somebody's going to like so sh- yeah absolutely. like whether they should do it or someone should do it like there's some there's not any like moral or ethical imperative there's just it's going to happen like it's gonna as, happen. as technology gets better and like we have the ability to track this stuff someone's going to aggregate it and make it available that's the natural tendency of anything that's competitive like this but it did take away and and i i didn't really expect it to or i kind of thought like this could happen but it seems unlikely like limited is so complicated it's not really going to replace the nuance of being a really skilled drafter but it turns out, I think it does replace the level of nuance that I am capable of. Yes, and that is the so, important part. Is like 
there is still, if you have a table full of eight players that all are equally aware of the established limited meta as informed by 17 lands, you can still have an interesting draft, right? It's not that draft is ruined. It's that it introduces this barrier of like, you can either draft a bunch to learn this stuff, or you can just read up on the 17 lands right. data and figure out what the best decks are. And if you're sitting at a table of like a wide level of enfranchisement, which we mostly are, like we are not drafting at a table full of like eight players at all of day two to GP. Like there's a, a wide level of, of skill and, and, and enfranchisement in our play group. And yeah, having the 17 land stuff just like it completely ruined the like discovery aspect of limited where it was like completely. you could have these disagreements and like players could argue about the viability of a particular deck or card. And it's like you still can, but there is kind of a right answer. <laughs> like you yeah. can kind of de- demonstrate that like actually you shouldn't first pick that because this deck is that much worse than this other deck that this C plus in deck A is just better than that B minus or B plus in deck B. And I don't know. It just, it really did. I, I it, it sort of changed limited into an environment or, or sort of a social experience that is much more like constructed, which it never appealed to me did. for the reason of I'm not, again, like somebody out there is brewing new decks and having that sort of experience, but I'm not going to be the person brewing new decks that are going to break the format. So right. the only way for me to meaningfully contribute and try and like participate optimally is I just have to like go look up what the what the current deck is that in is the meta the, and play it. That's the perfect way to describe it. Like the actual thing that really drove me away from constructed magic was that I didn't want to just take a deck that someone else had already tested to within it into its life, maybe swap out a cyborg card or two and play it. Like the meta was kind of established. If I was going to play constructed magic, I would want to be grinding on the periphery and like brewing decks and like trying to find edges. And what that means if you're a competitive player is building a deck, getting a 75 together and then jamming it against all of the main meta decks, like dozens of times back to back with like other skilled players talking about little edges and like I just didn't, I had I didn't have a life that would facilitate that. It was not it was not a thing I could actually do, and so that's why I didn't get it. Like I basically like I was enough of a spike that I couldn't get into constructed if I was not going to be able to like spike it hard, and I couldn't just like oh I like infect so I have my infect deck I like keep on hand. Bad example because <laughs> infect has <laughs> infect has some uh, you know some some associations with it, but um most of the like people that play constructed in our play group as I can tell are like that they're like yeah I have a modern deck it's like a deck I like reasonably well enough and I just like have it and I was, that was never appealing to me and you're right you're exactly right that that is what limited feels like now it's like unless you are going to be the one grinding on the periphery and like really figuring out those like very narrow last two percent edges by playing and playing and playing and playing then what you should do to do well is just yeah yeah go load the page up on 17 lands and figure out what you're supposed to take and just like do your homework and doing your homework is just not what I like about magic and if you're thinking, you know, well, you can just not look at 17 lands and don't care about that. Uh, no, <laughs> like I never installed. <laughs> That's not how my lands. brain I've, works. I've like barely looked at it. Uh, however, it's it's changed the the what's the way to call it? Like just my the perception. Landscape. The, the, it's, the culture well, and landscape of the, the, the game. culture and landscape. But it is really about perception. It's about it's the way that I see it. And if I just ignored it, if if, if everybody had 17 lands and I didn't and I didn't know about it. I probably wouldn't care about it. I'd be like, oh, I'm losing like, a little I more. Suck but a lot. What weird. <laughs> uh, but I would probably still be having more fun. Yeah. So, but that's that. It's a hobby that's here to have fun. So just knowing that the game has changed in this way has just made me less interested in that way to play it. Well, I would argue, just like you said, we can't expect magic players as a whole to willfully ignore an edge because it doesn't maintain the integrity of the game. You can't expect an individual player and to also I wouldn't say like, that. oh, you better forget the 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 winning strategy in tic-tac-toe in order to maintain the integrity of tic-tac-toe. <laughs> no, beat tic-tac-toe, understand like that learning never process, play that shit game figuring out how to solve tic-tac-toe is great. But, well, it's not that great, but it's it's better than <laughs> playing tic-tac-toe for sure. <laughs> it's pretty not great in my, in my opinion. So that's maybe a little bit... <sighs> pessimistic overall but i feel like the the optimistic point i want to land on is that what we do have left Q, and baby. i think that i think i would not be surprised to see a big sort of upswing of people playing cube because it is this still like novel experience this novel space it lets you be spiky and creative at the same time and actually like solve novel problems and not just be focusing on that two percent that you're ten percent away from so you can't actually really enjoy that experience so hopefully through the fires of all this transformation will come out purified on the other side. This is an article, with baby. Cube. This is an article. One of us has to write it. We can write it together, word by word, <laughs> right here. <laughs> so, let's talk about magic. Okay. Decisions. No, that was, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, we, 
make a conscious effort to like not be negative or pessimistic on my show very often because I don't think it's that much fun to think about. And so much magic content is talking about how the sky is always falling <laughs> and Wizards is always ruining the game and every format's always broken and bad and R&D is like suspect. Like, And we just... First of all, I think most people are completely wrong about that stuff and so <laughs> we can talk about the integrity of those arguments. But also... I play this game because I like it, and I talk about it with you every week because I like talking about it, and I like playing this game. I don't want to talk about the stuff I don't like about it, right? We don't have to focus on it. So I, I think it's worth acknowledging these things. Like, there are a lot of trends in the game, and just, like, it's connected to trends in the broader world, right? Like, you cannot have a game with the, like, integrity and spirit of, like, the early days of Magic in 2021 because we have all this tracking. Everything is going to be digital. Like, mm -hmm. it's just it, it, the natural trend of everything, right? Right. And as someone that tries to avoid spending time on screens, like more and more, all the stuff people are spending, all the art and culture people are spending time making is on screens. And so it's just like you either have to check out of society or, you know, learn how to get over it. And that's kind of how I feel about Magic. But like I said, like Cube to me, like the reason I've like redoubled and the reason we spent so much time and effort this year working on this podcast and like building our little community is because of the fact that it is the like one bastion of Magic that I unequivocally love and will always love because... It can't be ruined. And I feel confident like putting my time and energy into that as opposed to, you know, getting really invested in Commander and then they print some new Commander card that just is a staple in everyone's deck now and having just endless conversations about like what a power level is appropriate and how do you rate your decks and all this kind of stuff. It's like those all exist. And like EDH rec, honestly, is a very similar, occupies a very similar oh, space that 17 lands does where it's like, if you want to build a good commander deck, like, yeah, you're just supposed to look that up. Like, you're not really supposed to dig around Scryfall yourself anymore. You're just supposed to go, like, look it up. I, I do want to be really clear there that I, I don't think either of us are saying any individual or any particular aspect is, quote unquote, ruining the game. It, it is sort of just the, the nature of having a lot of people focusing a lot of attention on a thing. You know, Checkers, yeah. Checkers was a fun game that there were competitive tournaments of, of for a long time. And then the game was solved. And just like with tic-tac-toe you can't say like no everybody forget how to win and like let, let's preserve this moment of innocence like that's not and actually i do think meaningful. that in some ways commander is a shining example of a lot of people do willfully not play the most powerful effects that and is true there and is interesting. A, there is a culture of like we are not all gonna just jam the best cards necessarily now weirdly there is a culture of we're all just gonna jam soul ring there's some things to unpack there for sure and this is not the show to do it but there is something about the fact that that format has like by to by hook and by crook it, they're fighting tooth and nail but they are somehow maintaining some kind of culture of like we are not just going to blindly optimize it's really hard i actually just built a new commander deck this week uh because i played a little bit with a, a new crowd it's good to see a new crowd of people coming up at the lgs and i was like let's build a, a, a less tuned deck and it, it's really hard it can cast like genesis wave for like 22 on turn five and yeah. it's like oh man yeah especially when you have collections I started like ours. with a fun i started with a fun commander i was like no tutors no artifacts and, and, and <laughs> <laughs> degenerate things about magic you know Art we got tutors artifacts those are degenerate you can't have those well also you know first i grabbed the green box and then the white box and then i had enough cards <laughs> before i grabbed there the you artifact go. don't box. even bother grabbing the mana crypt and it soul takes ring it box. takes a, it, exactly exactly so cube is great and it, it's good to be reminded of why cube is important it's not just because you know i like using snapcaster mage to flashback lightning bolt what's an example of a combination that you can't really do with constructive magic it's not just because i like casting balance in a fair control deck it's because it's the only way for me to play the kind of magic that i love and for people to sit down at the table without any sense of like meta solving the format and to have the conversations that i love about what's viable here what's not viable here that interaction like those discussions around the draft table and afterwards are like a huge part of why i love magic and those that's the sort of space that is naturally encroached upon by the ever march forward of like the technologification of the game and the, the technologification and, and also just the scale of player base now yeah so cube is great we gotta write an article about this we did go for a whole hour you know part way through there i was like we're going through these questions mm -hmm. real fast but it turns out there was a lot to talk about in the last one so uh got you a full regular length episode thanks for tuning into the show uh if you've been tuning in i saw a couple people tweet or, uh, you know, throw, show us on Discord that they, you know, listen to every single episode of the show this year, according to the Spotify Wrapped. If you're one of those people, you know, we're very glad you're here. And I hope that the show continues to be rewarding and meaningful to you because that's why we make it. Because we don't get any money from uh, cryptocurrency Ponzi schemes for making this show. We just, uh, we do it for the love of the game. Yeah, but we do it for the community. We do it because we like meeting people and talking about this game, which is a fun game. If you want to move to Baltimore and be part of our friend group, uh, homes are still relatively affordable mm -hmm. compared to the rest of uh, the cities in the East Coast and West Coast. So uh, 
Uh, give us, give it. If you do, let us know. You're welcome to come and join our play group out here. But that's it for the show this year. I will. I do this so rarely. You know, I do it like once every quarter. I've got kind of a like reminder set up. If you don't mind popping over to iTunes and leaving us a five star rating and a review, a written review, uh, it does help the show. It really helps people find it. And it also, like when we do link to the show to people that, especially like guests we want to invite on or things like that, having a nice meaty chunk of reviews there really helps give us some legitimacy and let people know that we're real and not just you know i mean we are just some guys in your basement talking into microphones about magic but we've been doing it for a while we're committed to the bit Mm -hmm. these things come out every 7 a.m every every monday we haven't missed a week we're trying real hard here so if you uh want to want to help the show uh, we're not taking your money but we will take your reviews so that will be really helpful all the music for this show is produced by dj james nasty also part of the local baltimore magic scene All the magic cards, the ones we like and the ones we don't, are produced by Wizards of the Coast. And this show is produced by Thinking About Magic and Talking to Microphones About It. Thanks for a great year, Anthony. Thanks for a year, Andy. (laughs) Are you excited for the most exciting thing about this year, uh, December 24th? I know this is in the past for our listeners, but for you and I, we still have two days of crossing our fingers. What's December 24th? Well, obviously, the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope, the most mind Is that blow- December 24th? Well, it's gotten delayed by about 20 years. I saw, that, I saw that it had been delayed a couple times, but I didn't realize it I was think, currently scheduled for the 24th. I think this time, it's gonna, it's gonna launch. I couldn't be more excited. This is just... It's just one of the most mind-blowing projects that humanity has ever undertaken, and I'm so excited. Do you think somebody messed up a metric to Imperial unit conversion like they did with Hubble, and they're going to have to redo the entire thing at ex- massive expenditure after it's up in space? You have no idea how over budget <laughs> and over time this project is. That's I could happened. guess. <laughs> I, I could guess. You know, that tends to be that way. But uh, but yeah, I, space exploration is great. Love to fund it. That's a great example of the thing I totally did a 180 on from like my early 20s to now my mid 30s in terms of what I feel and think about it. For a long time, I was like, spending money on space is pointless. We have all kinds of domestic problems and homeless people and like things with need here. We should not be spending money in space. And then now uh, with my- Both, both are true. Well, f- first of all, there's a couple of points. There's, if, you, if you feel that way, if that's the argument you hold, let me offer you some counter arguments real quick here to maybe help you speed up your evolution. It took me about 10 years. Number one, of the money we spend on space is spent paying people on Earth to do jobs. So the money is not going into space. The money is providing people reasonable jobs and stimulating the economy. And those jobs are in science and research, which is very cool. The other thing about... uh, That's a great point. The other thing about space is that it's like one of the only ways to fund advancements in technology that is not uh, directly linked to the Defense Department and the military. If you start looking at where we fund science and research and technology in the United States, at least it is like 85% DARPA (laughs) and the defense department and a little bit of some other stuff. And so if we're going to have a bunch of money, we're going to spend on science technology, which I think we objectively should. I'm going to be pushing for so much more of it to go to space than I am to cool new missiles that can blow up people with ever increased precision. It's also like the, the fundamental pursuit of what, how, what is the universe and what's going on. And that's what's really cool about uh, this particular telescope is it's going to be able to look so much deeper into space and deeper into time than anything we've ever had before. And it could really change the way we think about the universe. It's amazing how relatively old Hubble is and how it's still up until, you know, is it still functioning? I know it was like it's still functioning. in and out. It's been in and out. It's, it's been, been a big a little project. Bit. That one was a little over budget, too. <laughs> it was certainly over budget when they had to regrind that entire lens and fly it up to space when they messed up that, that imperial so symmetric the, the unit conversion. So the challenge with, uh, with this new telescope is we cannot fix it. It is way too far away. Well, not yet, but it's going to be. But yeah, well, hopefully they'll do a little bit of testing before they uh, blast it all the way out there. Yeah, they've been doing I'm sure testing. some people have thought about this. It's probably some unit tests on the James Webb Space Telescope. Anyway, it's amazing how Hubble still, for how old it is, still produces the most incredible images we've seen of space. And now we're going to do so much better with the James Webb Space Telescope. So I agree. I'm excited. I didn't realize the launch was so soon. Important space news update. Space news. The uh, the little dark LSV bit that I had that barbershop quartet record has Uh-oh. taken on a new meaning. Uh-oh. <laughs>
<laughs> not sure we're gonna I never, get. I never liked, not sure we're gonna get a lot more mileage uh, out of that one. <laughs> I never liked inviting the comparison, but uh. <laughs> Dark LSV.